testing tensile samples made out of PA6CF by Bamboo Lab. For any of you that have done mechanical testing of any material, you know that if a sample breaks out of the gauge length, the data collected from that sample is considered unusable. The interesting part is that for this in particular, orientation directly on the build plate with a 90 degree raster angle, each one of these samples, all five, failed outside of the gauge length in a very similar region. This is a perfect example as to why the plastic standard meant for in injection molded machined plastics does not make sense for 3D printed plastics because there's a very key difference. We slice it with a toolpath with super specific process settings. Properties are not isotropic. Hello and welcome to Strelkomania. This video is more of a discussion on the fact that current standards being used for material testing 3D printed parts really don't make all that much sense. This particularly applies to 3D printed parts that have evident voids, greater anisotropic properties, and have a toolpath that is followed. Okay, so now that we're in a slicer, let me emphasize on what I mean. So those samples you saw in the intro clips were tensile dog bones that look like this they have a five millimeter height we can check that in this resize button five millimeter height they're printed flat on the builds plate and the raster angle was something i was varying to see how it would affect the strength of the part coupled with the print orientation let's slice this normally with a 45 degree infill direction or raster angle where the raster angle is just the angle at which the part gets filled in for each layer we see this 45 degree angle and each layer is 90 degrees opposite to each other so you can see that when I go down the layers. From the previous samples they kind of cracked all outside of the gauge length. The gauge length is this center straight piece which for this sample it's 50 millimeters and this is where we're looking for elongation of the part as it's being stretched. Any break within that 50 millimeters is considered a successful test and we can use that data to characterize the sample. If it breaks outside of this region, particularly here or anywhere else outside, it is an inconclusive test. So zooming in to here, we can see that filling in at a 45 degree angle does give us really small voids here. This is as to be expected. You can almost think of layer fill or solid layer fill as like coloring in a coloring book. You start with a shape and you might approach with a crayon or a coloring pencil at an angle to fill in that shape. And then you'll have to go back in some areas at a different angle to really get that color even. An angle that you choose might not be the best angle depending on the geometry of your final part. So let's see what happens when I change my infill to the 90 degrees that I was testing. Hit 90, slice the plate, and then let's zoom in. What we can start to notice is these larger void areas that are in this curved part of the dog bone, exactly where my part failed in all five of my tests of this raster and build orientation. Again, each layer is 90 degrees opposite of each other. When it's 90 degree infill this way, there's a lot smaller voids, but the next layer after that is again flipped and we have these large triangular voids up around the curvature. From looking at this toolpath, I can evidently conclude that the reason why we had a failure site here was because of these void structures. If all five of my tests failed in the same region outside of the gauge length, I can conclude for the most part that it was due to the toolpath, but I can't conclude any tangible stress strain data from the data I collected from this sample because it's an inconclusive test. I can't use the data. It failed in an undesirable region. So how do I test this orientation or these process parameters based on the normal plastic standard? I literally can't. And that's why I wanted to make this video to kind of pick your brain and to emphasize that the current standards that we use for 3D printing are based on normal solid plastics that have no layer by layer fabrication and no raster fill or process parameters. Like I mentioned earlier, all of this is a bigger deal for the type of processes that fill a layer based on a toolpath instead of curing, melting, binding, or centering a layer. A standard developed for material extrusion or filament based 3D printing would probably vary compared to 
a material jetting one where there's a lot of internal porosity of the part or a metal 3D printed sample. I feel as though metal 3D printing where you're basically welding each layer together would be appropriate to explore via a metal standard with some modifications because when you weld metal together it's pretty much a solid hunk. It doesn't have that internal porosity or those voids that we saw in the slicer. So I've been in the lab quite a bit this term and the past term testing a bunch of tensile samples. When it comes to understanding the properties of a material, whether it's brittle or ductile, how it might perform in future applications depending on a load, we use a standard to test a material or a sample of a material to be a certain shape with a controlled force applied to it to figure out its strength. So for example, all that ramble, a tensile test where we have a dog bone shape, we pull it apart to see how strong a material is under tension. Then we have compressive tests where it's usually a prism or a cylinder, and then we squish it with a controlled known force at a certain rate to see how much load it can withstand compressively. There's also a bunch of others like torsion, twisting, it's more of a circular dog bone, and then there's an impact test, etc. Each one of these tests allows us to further understand a material based on how load is being applied. For each one of these types of tests, there is a standard that's followed based on the material that basically identifies the shape and dimension that we use for a test sample, the kind of rates we apply, and how we define the results. The one currently used for 3D printed parts, particularly plastic 3D printed parts, is a standard for traditionally machined or manufactured plastics, meaning machine plastic, injection, compression, etc. molded plastics. And that is a problem. Why? Because 3D printed plastic is not the same thing as traditional plastics in the sense that we have one extra key difference. Do you know what that difference is? Let's stop and think. Jokes aside, I'm talking about process parameters and the fact that we slice our part with custom settings layer by layer, which introduces unique properties within a part that goes far beyond to the point where we're not only testing the actual plastic, but the process parameters that we selected in slicing. And this is a problem because I might run into a scenario where I want to test a sample of a certain build orientation material select collection of slicing settings that continuously keeps failing on me in a way where I can't extract key data. Material data sheets. When you buy a filament, you might notice that it has a few parameters about tensile strength, Young's modulus, etc. Key mechanical properties that'll help you further understand the material you're working with. If you further read into the test standard for collecting that data, you'll quickly realize that only a few basic print orientations are tested to collect that value, and then it's averaged out. So usually in your data sheet, you'll have the filament manufacturer print apart standing up on the build plate, 90 degree in the Y orientation. You have one fully printed flat on the build plate, and maybe a 45 degree angle build in the mix. Although these three orientations are probably the most commonly used in a slicer, a part at 30 degrees or 50 15 degrees or 75 will act significantly different than one at 90, flat, or 45. Basically what I'm saying is the data on a material data sheet is not comprehensive and it fully depends on the slicer settings you choose, that being the orientation you pick, the angle you fill in each layer. There's a matter of the infill you use, how many walls you put, your layer height, your bead width, all those things that in the current standard we use for normal plastics is not taken into account. Now to clarify, so for example, if I'm testing a 3D printed part and I build it this way and I'm pulling it this way, I'm relying solely on how well the adhesion between each of these layers is because I'm pulling the part away at its layers. Now. That's probably going to be our weakest orientation for tensile strength. But if I print a piece fully flat on the build plate with the layers going longwise like this, then I flip it up like this and pull it in my tensile machine. Now, instead of relying layer by layer like this on this inner layer strength, I'm working along the layers and the on the build plate orientation will give me the greatest strength of that sample. Keeping orientation in mind, you might have a multi-dimensional part with complex geometry that has localized regions of certain build orientations. One section of a part might have a different strength than the other just because of the layer by layer nature of 3D printing and the fact that we're picking our own processes. It's not just a solid hunk of plastic. So part of an updated standard for this filament or material extrusion based printing would be redesigning the 
sample shape. Instead of a dog bone that has these curvature areas that as we saw with this 90 degree raster can create pretty bad void propagation sites, why don't we explore a tensile sample that is fully rectangular without any of this geometry? Or slice it in a way where we don't get these voids. Slicing it in a way where we minimize voids would not always be possible, specifically if we want to get results for orientations that do cause these major voids. Whether we go in and iron each layer while we're printing, gap fill after every layer with a void focused toolpath, or we print overlapping beads. Something needs to change here for these testing standards. These were just some thoughts, comments, ideas that came through my mind while I was in the material testing lab last week, tensile testing PA6 CF parts, and having a case study where every single one of my five samples broke in the same region outside of the gauge length, making all my data for that case unusable. 3D printing has more complexity than one might think when it comes to characterizing the performance of that material. Because like we saw in the slicer and how I mentioned, you're not just testing the strength of the plastic, you're testing the strength of the slicer parameters you use to print in that plastic. Where I'm comparing solid plastics and 3D printed plastics like apples and oranges, where both are ABS, one solid and one is technically not because of the toolpath. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this and if you've ever basically read through a data sheet and printed a part thinking it would be one strength, put it in your end use application and were surprised to see it failed in an unexpected way. 3D printing or the world of additive manufacturing is something that is continuously growing and researchers, industry, etc. are constantly finding new holes in the way we define and do things. So these kinds of discussions not not only open our way of seeing towards this technology, but can help answer some pretty big questions in the field, or at least find people to help. 